um, author Wendy. of the Orange Grove. Um, thank you so very much to coming along and having this talk with me for backstory. Um, this is your um, second novel. So did you want to talk about what this novel is about? Yes, it's about a group of mistresses in a chateau in 18th century France. And they're kind of cohabiting, um, you know, quite, you know, without incident, they're okay until a new mistress comes into the mix and the Duke unexpectedly falls in love with her, which makes the Duchess extremely jealous. And so she starts up a campaign of um, a malicious campaign against her. And this means that my main character, Henriette, is forced to choose between her position and morality. Yep. No, I'm and, that's and I'm really enjoying it. It's it's a real hot house of um, that you've constructed here, and um, you're getting a. Re I'm getting a real sense of how these women's lives are so much underneath the control of the male dominant group, and it's 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 really remarkable what you have achieved. Um, I'm, I'm haven't finished it yet, but I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, it's going to be. I'm, I'm a very easy read, um, so it's always good to know <laughs> when you want to keep reading a book too. Um, so, why write historical fiction? For me, there's a number of reasons. One of them is that I love learning about different periods and through research, and I, you know, I really enjoy. Um, the different paths that that takes me down as I, I found out about, you know, how people live their lives at different times. I also find it really absorbing as I'm writing. I get into that world and I don't find, I have written um, more contemporary stories and I don't find that same level of absorption when I write. So for me, it's, um, it's just more pleasurable to go into these other worlds. And I suppose my hope is that, you know, the readers will also be absorbed in them. Have you always been interested in history? Yes, uh, very much so. It was one of my favourite subjects at school. And um, I just, I remember almost, you know, I went into old places. I could almost imagine these other times. Um, even then, I, yes, I had a fascination with it. And I used to draw pictures of, women in these, you know, elaborate um, sort of 18th century or 19th century gowns and, yeah, total fascination with and the time other of, time. The time of Louis the Fourteenth has that been a particular interest too? At that time when I was a teen and a kid, not so much, but as I got older and I, you know, learnt French and, um, and travelled to France numerous times, it became an interest, yes, because it was just so decadent and opulent. And his love of beauty was, you know, really famous. He, it was something that was really important to him. I'll give you an example of that. Um, he had a, a special, um, so it was like a school for young women who um, were from very good, you know, from aristocratic backgrounds, but their families had fallen on hard times. Yeah, yeah. So he set up this school with, I think it was Madame de Maintenon, and they had this beautiful um, uniform. Um, like I think they had a beautiful cape and, and it was all very lovely and they had these special gloves. And then as, you know, things progressed and, and people got fairly unhappy with um, how decadent the aristocrats were and, and specifically the king's court, um, there was a bit of an, an outcry and they said, gosh, you know, they just give them more basic things to wear and, you know, um, change what the curriculum and, and, you know, they tried to sort of, um, change it to be more humble. Yep. And he said, all right, that's fine, but can they please just keep the gloves? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's, that's a great <laughs> And that just sums up him, really. I mean, that was him. So. <laughs> yeah. Did you see examples of those gloves? I mean, were there any gloves in museums that you saw? I mean, I love looking at gloves. No. No, I didn't. But, um, I, I studied a lot of the, the portraits yeah. of the nobles when I was um, I was actually there while I was writing it um, in Paris. And, yeah, I found that just the visuals of seeing them all mm. uh, was fantastic. I didn't get time to go out to Versailles on that trip, but I had been as a teenager, mm. so I still had visual memories of it. Um, but, yeah, there was so much research. But the research for 
this book. I mean, it was just an absolute joy and a pleasure because it was so much of it was fascinating to me. So was the story based on truth? Were these true women? No, it's not. But I did see um, early on in my research, I came across a quote by, it was an actor called Fleury who had uh, spoken about someone called the Prince of Soubise yeah. who had... Um, something like six carriages trailing behind his carriage and in each carriage was one of his mistresses and they all had their own livery and um, the other word was equipage. I'm not even quite sure what equipage is, <laughs> to be honest, but they had that. And I yeah, I remember thinking in that moment, wouldn't it be interesting to explore those relationships? And you know, surely some of them would be very hostile, of course, but some of them would be friendships. So I wanted to kind of, um, imagine that and, and, and bring that to life. Was it hard to construct those relationships? Yes, <laughs> it was. Um, I'm a pantser, not a plotter, so um, in some ways that you do create difficulty for yourself when you work that way, mm. but I, I enjoy um, the mystery of it and not knowing quite where things are going to go. So yeah. um, I think the hardest thing was probably... I suppose the level of research had to be, you know, very meticulous is one thing. And trying to incorporate um, the theme that I had come up with, which was um, about morality, trying to kind of layer that through the narrative, that was quite challenging. Um, and also there are a lot of characters and I wanted each character to be fully developed and to have a backstory and to have a character arc. So, again, that was a little bit challenging, but, um, but I enjoyed it. Did you, did you just have character profiles down in their, their family history? <laughs> um, I, I don't always write down the backstory. The backstory tends to emerge as I write them. Yeah. But I do generally, I've started to have um, just a visual, uh, you know, some of the, the traits. So in Scrivener, there's a, you can, it's like a, a template that you can use and you can write all the physical descriptions, traits, um, that kind of thing. Just sometimes I'll be writing a scene and I'll forget what eye colour they have or I'll forget those types of things. So it's good to have a reference. Yeah, I, I use that too. And I think it's a fantastic tool for writers. It's, you know, it's wonderful, I'm, isn't it? All my research is in one place, thank God, rather than me yeah. have to sort of try to remember which folder did I put that particular information in, which I need now. <laughs> Yes, I love that too. I find it so useful and I'm just always referring to it. I'm always copying and pasting links into the, you know, the different folders and yeah, it's, um, it's just, it's really great. It's very I don't know how I managed before, to be quite honest. Me, me, either. It. me either. I mean, I'm a very organic writer as well. I mean, we were talking about this before, about how our characters tell us what they, you know, unexpected things you think, oh my God, how am I supposed to do, do this? But... <laughs> The character tells you this, you just have to go along with it. Otherwise, You've got to run with it. <laughs> you can't ignore them. <laughs> They'd be very unhappy if you did. You just, <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that part of writing too. It's very magical, very magical. Now, you were a visual artist before now embracing, you were um, a visual artist, now you're a word artist. Um, you want to talk about the journey from one thing to the other and how how the visual art feeds into the writing? Because I think that... I'll start with how it feeds in first. Um, so it makes me a very visual writer. Mm. So all the visual details are incredibly important to me. I want the reader to be able to see um, what I'm seeing and, and for them to be able to see what I'm seeing, I need to see it clearly. And to do that, I need to do my research my visual research um, along with my factual research. So, um, so yeah, I think those creating painting with words is yeah. important to me. So that's the way it comes through. And it also comes through in my process um, in being, you know, in writing it's called being a pantser. In painting it's just what I used to do is I would have a, a study um, that I worked from and the painting would start based on that study and then it would go off on its own journey. You know, it would kind of evolve into something maybe different to that study, but containing the essence of it. So I think that the way I write is very similar. Um, I'll have it something, some kind of base and then it will evolve. 
into what it's going to evolve into. Yeah. Um, in terms of the journey, that was a very long journey um, and one that I didn't expect. So I exhibited for 14 years and at around 2010, I was an artist in residence for a gallery in Albert Park and I was having a wonderful time. I was probably at the peak of, of my career, really. I was um, a finalist in a number of prizes at the time. Um, I'd had an exhibition in Berlin. Um, I was, you know, I'd, I was achieving everything I wanted to achieve. And so the thought that I would change careers certainly wasn't in my mind. But then the gallery closed down. And so I thought, well, I've got to find another gallery. And I started to kind of try and do that. Um, but then simultaneously, I had a dream about a particular character and started writing this manuscript. Um, it was a supernatural thriller, believe it or not. Um, so set in um, the, gosh, what was the first time period? I think it was the 40s or I can't even remember now. And then the other period was contemporary. Um, so, you know, I wrote that in eight months. It was messy. It was choppy. I had no idea what I was doing. So I see that now as my, um, my like a teacher. It was, some, it was a manuscript that just gave me an idea of how I might construct a yeah. story. Um, having said that, it did have some publishing, publisher interest um, and it didn't that. end up kind of coming off in the end. Um, I was asked to do a redraft. For it um, and then that took me six months and then when I went back to them the editor that had requested the redraft had left so then I had to go through a whole nother pre you know you had to go to the, the guy who ran the um, publishing company and then because I was so uncertain at that point I had you know not a lot of confidence um, in what I was doing I used to let things sit for a very, very long time. I, I was scared of being assertive. I was scared of asking questions. So I let that sit for another six months, I think, before yeah. I went and said, oh, did you read my book? And then said, yes, and the answer is no. <laughs> it's like, and I was very sad. <laughs> and then a friend at the time suggested that I just had another book, and, and I did, and that was Stone Circle. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and then that was a whole other story of how that all ended up becoming published. But um, yeah, if you had have told me that my whole life would change and I would become a writer instead of, I mean, yes, I loved writing my whole life and I was part of me, but I didn't expect that I would ditch painting. <laughs> Do you feel unfaithful to your first love? Yes, I feel horribly mean. <laughs> Particularly when I stick my head in my studio and see the painting that's been sitting there for a really, really long time and and it's not a good painting and I should just start something else. And then maybe I would go in there if I had something good to work on. <laughs> yes. yes, it's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So that I reckon all um, creative writers should do a visual course because I think it is um, very, very important for writers to be able to, um, to be able to work out the words for colours and, you know, rather than just red and blue and whatever. And, you know, there's so many different tones and just to be able to... you how to see. I think if you haven't... Um, yeah. you see, when you've done visual art training, you see things a bit differently. For instance, um, if you're trying to draw something, you don't... If, so just say, to give an example, you're trying to draw um a teapot so most people would try and draw it they would just think what do i think a teapot looks like and they would draw like mm -hmm. that but the, the key to that is to look at the actual shapes and the lines and the mm -hmm. curves and not not what you think it should look like but what it actually does look like yeah so that's a completely different way of seeing that if you haven't kind of done the training maybe you don't see that way yeah um so yes it does change your perspective and it makes you notice small things yeah um, yeah. No, I've only read a couple of chapters of your book and already I can see that you are such a visual writer and, um, and, and you bring it alive. So, you know, that's, that's the thing is to be able to immerse a reader in a setting is so vitally important when you're crafting a fictional, a fictional work, which is what we're, we're doing. Yeah. I think it's particularly important in historical fiction to be able to see it because it's oh, a world that's foreign and yet 
people haven't seen it. So they, may, I mean, you don't want to sort of be boring them with paragraph after paragraph description. Of course, you've got to break it up with dialogue and and, and action. But um, but yeah, for me, it's but you know, other people, it's not important. Like I know uh, writers and readers that um, they just want action. They're, they're actually not that interested in having yes. you know the scene okay. painted to them. Yeah. So, you know, it is personal preference, I suppose. Well, I hope that, is that as writers, we are writing what we like to read. And I love to, I love reading um, another, I like to be immersed into a world and to be able to see it without, you know, I like to see, I like the, 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 the magic of words bringing alive a world too. So it's um, exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. I think someone like Kate Grenville does it very well. Mm. Um, in her descriptions and I'm very inspired by her writing for that reason yeah um, not only does she bring it to life but she uses words um, that are unexpected yeah in, in creating that that visual language so I think that's something to yeah I find it very inspiring any other writers that you are inspired by Yes, um, well, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, yeah. I love his lyrical. Oh yeah, he's not with us anymore. Um, but his lyrical style and his the rom romance in his mm. novels that are often about love oh, and um, love. Very passionate. <laughs> I love all of that. Yeah. Um, I like Zadie Smith. Yeah, but I don't try. I don't uh, not in the sense that I try and emulate her writing. Um, more just I enjoy her her work because it's very honest and funny and observant mm. um and yeah so those are probably my three off the top of my head that the ones that spring to mind mm. and so what does writing history have to say to the present well i think that uh it tells us that in terms of our emotions and our emotional priorities those things are unchanged and a perennial such as wanting to be loved, wanting to have friends, wanting to um, connect with other people. I think that's something that's unchanging. But obviously the context in which those emotions are had is very different. So, you know, when you're writing it, you need to, um, you know, always have that in your mind, at the front of your mind, along with trying to portray these authentic emotions. Yeah, I love that quote from The Go-Between. The past is another country, and I think that's something that we need to remember. Um, it, 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 they did things differently there, <laughs> and the expectations were different too. And yeah. you know, and, and because you know, and you're obviously writing you know, women characters as well, so you have the same thing where you're trying to bridge that balance between um, being entertaining and create a, a plot that you know. Um, powers along, mm. but also uh, being mindful of the fact that you know they didn't have the same agency that we have, and yeah, just being aware of that. And it's very difficult because you you don't want them to be a rag doll and to have no personality and to just be sort of blown around, you know, by what everybody else is doing um, because that's very boring on the page. So it's it's very difficult it's, it's a balancing act isn't it so you've got to mm. say how authentic the lives were in that period of time yet um show that um you know women are working out how to navigate their world and and to claim the power that's being taken from them in various different ways yeah it's, it is yeah, often those ways are more subversive and more yeah. manipulative and more hidden Yes. Um, whereas I think, you know, women today would just kind of state their needs and, and just come out with it and just be a bit more direct. So this is, this is, this is a journey that we've traveled. Thank God. <laughs> all <laughs> yeah. to do with the fact that with the other women who've gone through, well, I always find that when I'm writing about my tutor women, um, and cause my, my tutor women are women of nobility that their lives, it's almost like enclosure. It's very claustrophobic, their, their lives, because they're ha ha yeah. inside and in the birthing chamber and, you know, bed chamber and all that sort of thing. And yes, that's exactly right. Very There's not a lot of um, 
physical kind of, you know, athletic stuff going. They're just kind of constrained and domestic and embroidering and, you know, taking care of children and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, um, although in the Orange Grove, I do have a bit of, they get out on the horses. That's how they kind of, <laughs> they go horse riding or they um, go on a picnic or, or whatever, I try to get them out as much as I could. But you're right, the majority of it is that very, domestic interior life mm. Mm. um do you do your novels all share similar themes um they do they, i mean there's other things that have varied but i think for me it's been a lot of you know exploring separation and loss and um people discovering their identity yep. um and the reason for that is because I'm adopted, so it's something that I know very well. So it tends to just crop up. There are just missing children and there are people that, that love each other that can't be together and there are, you know, there are things like that that, um, that come up. And I think it's just very much embedded in my subconscious. Yeah, and that, that ties into that question that I was going to ask you about. All, all fiction writers, they, one of these questions, they always are told uh, as advice, write what you know. Mm. But this is the thing is that you, you're talking about things that we can use, like the loss and identity and think the very human things that we all know about, but we can take those things and use them for historical writing. I mean, both you and I, haven't lived, I mean, I haven't lived in the Tudor times. You haven't lived in the eight. Well, we don't know. Maybe we did. <laughs> Maybe we did live in these periods, periods of times in another life. But um, as far as we know, our own lives have been very much placed in, in the 20th and the 21st century. Uh, yeah. so, so it comes down to using emotional truth in the end. Yeah, you know, that's, how we, that's how we use our own experience through our emotional truths. Um, which we know better than anybody. So yeah, exactly, and then place that into just a, a different context and a different environment is, you know, fairly simple. Yeah. Now, I know you've completed a third novel and you're working on a fourth. Well done, you. Um, and <laughs> so did you want to talk about the completed novel? Yeah, so that's called The Glass House and that came from, um, I was originally sort of thinking of what I was going to write next. And I came across, um, there was this earthquake in Messina in Sicily in 1908. And it was a very catastrophic earthquake. There was a huge amount of lives lost and most of the buildings in Messina were yeah. destroyed. And I started to think about all the orphans from this event and how they might have fared and what their lives might have been like. And so my protagonist is one of those orphans. And she uh, spends the first sort of uh, 12 or so years of her life um, in an orphanage and then is adopted by a wealthy family in Palermo. And she has a strong friendship with another orphan called Agat and they are reunited many years later um, as young women in the capital and, uh, yeah, and are able to continue their friendship and they still have a, a strong bond. So I suppose that's to do with, that kind of links in with what I was saying about separation and, and longing and loss. And, you know, that sometimes, you know, there are a few people in our lives that actually um, maybe understand us in, in that deeper way. I don't think that that's something I'm speaking for myself, I suppose. I don't know if that's universal experience, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. It's a rare and special thing. And I wanted to kind of explore the idea of that um, through this relationship. Yeah, and um, and you have been surging along with your fourth novel, uh, and I know you probably don't want to talk about that, but it would be interesting for you to talk about the fact how um, this period of isolation in Australia has helped you as a writer. Um, yeah, well, it's been a godsend. Well, it's a terrible thing to say. It's a, it's a tragic situation, but for me, in my writing world, it's been really beneficial. <laughs> Um, because I'm just not having the distractions because normally my kids, I'm ferrying them here and there and I'm, you know, there's so much going on in their lives that I'm sort of um, taking care of. And because they were at home, I just had, I was able to just really focus and it was almost like being on a writing retreat. And so I wrote about 30,000 
in that period on this novel or manuscript. And um, yeah, it's been great to be able to do that. Um, I'm really happy. Tell me about your writing day. How does that work for you? Well, I'm not a morning writer, so the earliest that I would start would be around 11 or maybe lunchtime, you know, 12 or 1, something like that. And then I have my minimum of 500 words that I like to come up with. But during this period, that's kind of extended and my average output is more like 700 to 1,000 in a day, which has been great. Um, so, yeah, I generally just sort of write for a couple of hours you know, once I sit down. And, um, and then if often I find that I've sat down to write something, I just don't have enough information, so then I need to do a bit of more research which so kind of go along with that as well. Um, it's all part of the process. So, yeah, that's how it all how it works. I'm trying to be a little bit more, um, given that I've got the opportunity at the moment, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of going with it and because who knows when life could get all Easy. more complicated and I don't have the time. So, yeah, it's great to seize it when you can. And how, much is re how much is too much research? Do you get to a point where you think, that's it. I'm not going to do any more research. I'm just going to concentrate on writing. No, I'm not very good at letting go. <laughs> I tend to, um, because it fuels me so much and it takes me on threads that maybe I, I wouldn't even expect. So, um, and I, you know, as with most writers, I always obviously come across writing block quite regularly. So writer's block, and it helps me push past that. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of keep going and I keep, as long as I'm also writing enough and getting that steady um, output of words, that's, then, yeah, I, I do like to continue to research. Yep. And have you got any advice for an emerging writer who wants to be published? How would you suggest, I mean, they want to get an agent, they want to find a publisher. What are the sort of things that you would say are very vitally important for them to do? Well, first of all, get themselves a writing group so yeah. that they've got people who are going to make them accountable and um, they're going to, it just automatically makes you take it more seriously because How you've got people you who are... How did you find your writing group? How did you find your writing group? Um, well, I've ha had a, a few over the <laughs> time, <Right>. but um, <laughs> hasn't sort of remained the same. Um, but the current one, um, a, a, an author friend, um, she kind of brought together different friends that she already had and just brought us together. All right. yep. so, All and right. so we're half um, emerging and a half published. Yeah. Yeah. And other writing yeah. groups, how did you find those? Because I always find that's a very hard thing to, you can say find a writing group, but how do you do this? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the first one was because I did a short course at RMIT and we were in that class together and so we just started off this group. Um, and that went on for you know, quite a lot of years. Um, and then due to various work commitments and, and things like that, that people had, it kind of fell apart. We're still friends. We just don't meet for writing group anymore. Um, yeah, and then another one that I'm in simultaneously to the one that I described, I'm just trying to think how we, I think it was from Facebook. I think it was, yeah, because we're local. Um, we're all local. So I think it was, we set up a Facebook group that was for people around my area and um, we decided to, but it might have originally been from um, another Facebook group that, yes, it was. Someone said, oh, do you want to set up a group in this particular location and who's interested? And, yeah, we did it that way. And so, so, yes, through social media is good. And the other thing in terms of the emerging writers question, it's really important to, um, to produce lots of short stories and flash fiction and to submit them to competitions and to journals. Um, there's so many literary journals around for all different types of writing. Um, so as long as you read the, um, their guidelines thoroughly and make sure you're not sending something that's not, of their, not going to be interesting to them. Um, and they're, they're all over the world. There are just, you know, so many opportunities. And what I used to do is kind of just on Twitter, I would just kind of check them all out and I would go onto their website and I would just really target who I thought would be appropriate for my work. And that was a real stepping stone for me. That was how I ended up getting an agent because I already had these pieces out there. Um, 
So okay. I would highly recommend doing that. All right. So did the agent approach you or, or, or just because you've got that on your CV, you've got that on your CV? Yeah. Is, yeah. Is your agent in Australia? Yeah, she's in Melbourne. All yeah. right. Because you've got, a, you've got an USA publisher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so she cast, cast her net very wide. And, um, and with your first novel, was that um, prior to you having an agent? Or did you? No, no, she actually brokered that deal, yes. So oh, that is good. That is good, it's good to hear that. <laughs> um, the agent relationship is, um, yeah, very viable and, and obviously it works to your favour. <laughs> I've heard of others. Yeah, it's been outstanding and, um, yeah, it's, it's been good. So, yeah, she's very professional and supportive. And I think the most important thing with an agent is that they really believe in your writing, that yeah. they genuinely love it you know um otherwise how they're going to sell it you know they don't really, i suppose they wouldn't take you on if they didn't love it you know yeah yeah um now you i know that you've done a couple of writing courses at uni rmit yeah. in swinburne were they useful to you that's um, yes very much so yeah way. um i think well I suppose with the first one I did, which was the short course at RMIT, um, the particular teacher was just so, um, she was so inspiring. Like she just really brought out the best in everybody that she came into contact with and, and just was so positive and, you know, the kind of uh, advice that she gave, you know, is still with me today. I mean, a lot of it was really useful. So what, what, um, what advice sticks with you from her? I think it was just to kind of um, be um, to be in the in the body of, the, of your characters, to just kind of be embody them, and to kind of have all that that physicality. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was I think one of the things that she said. And then when I was at Spinburn, I had a, a really lovely um, lecturer for fiction as well, and. Um, yeah, again, just really encouraging. And I think when you have those interactions early on and they, these people kind of support you and, and say nice things to you, it means so much. You know, it really, it just stays with you and um, you're forever grateful to those people. Yeah. As you go along the journey, you don't forget, well, I don't forget all those people that, um, you know. along the way. Yes, I'm part of yeah. And I agree with you uh, and you shouldn't forget those people and I think that also helps you to I mean I always like to help other people because I always remember the people who helped me along the way um, yeah I think it all works together in this life doesn't it what you give out it does and I think it's, it's the kind of industry where it's it's so crucial and it's so much a part of the, you know that community network is a huge part of the Australian industry I think it's something that um, Something's really impressed me, actually. I, I find it um, wonderful the way that writers look out for one another on social media and, and just in general. Um, I certainly didn't find that to be the case in the art world. So um, sad. it's been um, fantastic. Because we think that both um, visual art and um, the writing world, the we've got a so this the competition is really horrible um, yes. part of it that's part of that's part of the way it is um and you just got uh, i always re remind myself um about how many talented writers there are out there and that's good it's really great but it does make it harder to um have those doors open for us i mean you get close to having a door open and someone else gets the opportunity not you <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's great that we've got so much. I've always tried to, I remember I read somewhere once about, you know, in terms of success and, and winning and losing, that there's always enough for everybody. Yeah. You know, to have, and to have that attitude of, you know, there's not a limited, it's not like it, it suddenly gets to this point, you know, like on a thermometer, it gets to, you know, this, and a red light flashes and then there's no more opportunities. You know, they're, they're there and they're around and there's enough. And um, and I think to think of it that way really helps because yes, it is incredibly competitive, and there are so many of us. 
um, but also everyone's on their individual journey and they're not always going to be wanting exactly the same thing. They're not necessarily want, wanting to be on the New York Times bestseller list yeah. or, you know, um, they might have ideas that are, you know, I'm sure a lot of people, they're not aspiring to that absolute top yeah. um, level. Uh, so, and I think if you have a clear idea within yourself of what that, what your level is or what you think is successful for you, mm. then that's, you know, helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. I and think, then you'll, yep. not only in terms of knowing what to work for, but in terms of not being jealous or envious of other people, because you think, well, that's not what I'm necessarily wanting anyway. And good on them for doing that, you know. <laughs> always worries me when I hear people wanting to be financially successful as a writer um, because few yeah. of us are. And I, I, I do see writing as my art form. And art to me is more to grow as a human being and to, to get better at my craft. 100% I agree with you so much yeah. yeah and I think as soon as you put money into it and you put that pressure on yourself as an artist that oh gosh you've got to earn money um, that just kills creativity and that just makes you go all kind of rigid and stressed and of course. you know um, I don't think that's the right kind of um, way to kind of approach it and, but if that comes and if that is a, somehow blossoms from this process great but I think to have that expectation is to set yourself up for, you know, a lot of stress and disappointment. Exactly, exactly. Um, do you walk in the footsteps of your characters? Meaning do I live their journey as I write their journey? Or do you is go that what you mean by that? Yeah, so with um, your book set in France, did you go to all the places? Ah, <laughs> I didn't go to Blois, um, but I've been to a number of other French towns and so I knew kind of, the basic setup and how they were so I felt confident that I could write it by um, doing a lot of google mapping and you know walking the streets that way yeah. um so I google yeah so I'd great, <laughs> <that's> great. <laughs> and I had yes yeah, so I've been to France I, I can't like at least I don't know I, I've lost count a little bit I've been to France quite a bit and I feel familiar and comfortable and yeah that I didn't need to go to that actual town um, and as I said I'd been to Versailles um, it was great with this with the glass house being able to go to Palermo because as I researched it I realized it really wasn't like Italy at all it was its own place with its own culture and its own unique way of seeing the world and so the more that I realized that the more I had this desire that I really wanted to go there and see it for myself. And um, that was, yeah, incredibly useful. Um, it's an amazing, amazing place. And yeah, they almost have a, di I think the reason they have a different attitude to the rest of Italy is because they've just been invaded so many times by so many different nationalities that it's made them quite defensive as a, um, as a people. They, they feel most comfortable with their families. You, know, family, you can trust family, can't really trust anybody else. That's kind of how it is a little bit. Yeah. Um, but they're also very lovely and welcoming and warm. At, you know, it's not that they're not in a general sense, but I think there is a little bit of um, protectiveness yeah. that comes from those invasions. Yeah. So this book is ready. This is the third novel that um, hopefully we'll find a publisher soon. So well, I've got to send it to my agent. That's the next step. So... I'm not doing that until my writing group have read the whole thing All right. and offered their feedback. So it's getting closer. And I sort of felt like with um, the COVID thing that um, there was less of a rush because I think maybe it's perhaps not the best time to be pitching at the moment anyway. I, I so um, Exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yeah, if it, it takes how long it takes for them to read it and then it can go. Yeah. It's all fun. Yeah. Now, your first novel was written in a male point of view. Um, did you yes. find it difficult? I didn't find it difficult, but having written um, from, you know, women's perspective since then, I do find it's more like a retrospective thing that now that I've written those stories, I feel so much more at home 
with telling those stories in a way um, because I know what it feels like to be a woman and, you know, it, it, yes. I. But um, having said that, when I was writing Antonius, um, I just, you know, I, I did very much get into his head and I felt that I was able to, um, to write him. It wasn't really an issue at the time. That sounds good. Now, would you like to do this reading for us? So I'm just going to do a reading from a part in the Orange Grove where Madame Fulbray, who's a friend of the Duchess, comes to visit and has dinner with them. And then Roma, who is the tarot card reader, does a reading for my main character, Henriette. The candelabra case cast snaking patterns on the walls and the silver glinted in the low light of the dining room. The Duke and Duchess sat at opposite ends, the mistresses and Romain on either side, and library servants took their places along each wall. The guest of honour, seated next to the Duchess, was Ma Madame Martine Fulbray, who was dressed in a white gown with silver thread, with a phalanx of diamonds circling her throat. This pea soup is quite delicious, Madame Fulbray pronounced. It's a balm to see, my dear, as always. Your Grace, your wife has such splendid taste. She advised me on redecorating my rooms at Versailles. The Duke tilted his head as if trying to make sense of a foreign language. Yes, redecoration, cushions, drapes, oriental vases and rugs. I seem to remember an endless process here several years ago and the exponential bill that followed. Fortunately, you have the King's coffers behind you. I must forage for money in the air. What a strange idea, Madame Fulbray smiled. Good grief, perhaps if you're foraging in the air, God might provide. And that he does, Madame. We're not at the poorhouse yet and may take pleasure in our comforts. The Duke swallowed the wine in his glass. Madame, my household visited the court recently. It was kind of you to look to their entertainment. Yes, they all made quite an impression. Mademoiselle du Massenet in particular, demonstrated her skill at word games. Letitia flushed with, with pleasure. Charlotte glared at Madame Fulbray. Beginner's luck, I imagine. I would recommend another game, but I hear Letitia's too busy traipsing around the countryside like some peasant girl to be interested in court. Letitia does like fresh air and riding. Exercise makes her even more beautiful, the Duke scowled at his wife. I don't believe these interests stop anyone from enjoying court. Charlotte frowned, her husband's meaning as subtle as an executioner's axe. She was to desist or he would insult her, a humiliating outcome in the present company. Charlotte glanced at Romain, seated next to Henriette. They appeared to be sharing a joke and she gripped her napkin in her lap, vowing to speak to him. She felt sealed off from them all, as if enclosed in a silent bell jar. She could not reach out, nor could anyone reach in. Henriette tapped her foot on the rug as she read a passage of Molière's Tartuffe. The words made little sense. She read them again, her mind scattered. The shelves of books reached the ceiling, their spines in reds and blues with gold lettering. Voluminous lilac drapes were drawn across the windows and she gave a furtive glance to the open doors. Romain hesitated at the entrance and looked behind him before entering. I hope you don't mind if I read without my costume and candles. I couldn't smuggle it all here without drawing attention to myself. Not at all. Please come and sit down. Romain dragged an oriental table in front of Henriette's chair and moved another into position for himself. With a flourish, he drew the tarot cards from, from his inside coat pocket and shuffled them. So, what is it you would like to know? My fate here at the Chateau, Henriette said. Romain spread the cards face down on the table. Pick five cards. Select them carefully, madame. Choose ones you feel particularly drawn to. Henriette turned over five cards. The Hermit, the Tower, the Lovers, the Ace of Pentacles and the Four of Wands. Romain examined the cards for a moment, touching each one. There'll be great upheaval in your life and a conflict which you cannot control. You'll be forced to make a choice. The Ace of Pentacles suggests a new start. 
you'll feel at home with this person, a sense of fulfillment. This is indicated by the Four of Wands. The lovers, of course, shows romantic love. You've been alone in your life, often feeling like an outsider looking in. This phase will end. The Hermit represents your past and the Four of Wands, a prophecy of your future, which suggests a partnership of sharing the bounty of life with another and celebration, harmony and new beginnings. Henriette, I don't feel your future entails life at this chateau. Although there are trials ahead of you, the outcome will be positive. However, as with all prophecy, the outcome is still dependent on human choice, which cannot be foretold with certainty. Henriette traced the outline of the lover's card with her index finger, where Cupid aimed his arrow at the pair from a cloud above. Thank you. Things are complicated already, you know. Roman placed a warm hand over hers, his thumb stroking the inside of her wrist. Yet if our lives were devoid of complications, how dull they would be. Henriette withdrew her hand slowly, her eyes level with his. Her breath was shallow and her mind raced. I can't do this, she thought. Being with him made her feel both pleasure and uncertainty. I must say goodnight to Solange. Thank you for the reading. Henriette rose abruptly to her feet. There's no need to go. Stay, have a brandy with me. I cannot. Perhaps another time. Good evening. Thank you.